What was the dream for you as a kid? Oh, that, that's another tough one. Um, I guess I didn't really dream. Every day was uh, was kind of living that dream, I should say. Um, we, you know how it is uh, when you, you know, especially uh, Caribbean families, you don't realize you're broke or poor until, <laughs> until somebody actually tells you, oh, you know, y'all ain't got shit, dude, yeah. you know. But, um, yeah, no, so I never had these big uh, lofty aspirations of, of, of anything. Um, hindsight, and it's kind of, it was part of me being broken, um, always striving to keep doing something more because you felt you weren't good enough. Mm. Um, I joke, uh, you know, in the Caribbean family, if you're not a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, you're a failure to the family. Um, so kind of that, that's pretty much how I, I grew up, always trying to do better. Um, from what I, it didn't matter what I was doing, I always felt like there was some something better to do, or I could do I could do better than that. It's funny that you mentioned that because you know, so I graduated from Princeton in 2013, and my um, my parents. It's funny I studied sociology, and they were always like, my grandma was like, "Are you going to be a social worker?" She was so disappointed, <laughs> and I had to explain to her that sociology, you know, sociology does not mean I'm going to be a social worker. But even now, just trying to explain being a podcaster in the media industry, I just still think my dad just told me the other day, you know, you should go back to school. This is a hobby, not a job. So I think there's always that um, that tension sometimes. Did you feel like, were you a creative kid? Like, did you ever see yourself going against the odds and doing something off the, the, the normal path one day? Or were you kind of like, all right, I'm got to figure this out. I'm just going to have like a cut and dry life. Um, I, I was always very creative. I was the guy who, who didn't need to read a lot. Um, I can see something and take it on. I was the tinkerer. I would take stuff apart. Mm -hmm. um, but none of that was really celebrated. You know, it okay. was, um, it was, I go try to follow the straight and narrow and then the creative takes over, <laughs> you know, go and follow the straight and narrow and then the creative. And honestly, I mean, I've gone to so much schooling um, because I would do like two or three years at a university to be an engineer, a doctor, a nurse or whatever. Yeah. And then, like year three, I'm like, no, the hell with this. I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm going to fly helicopters. I don't care. You know, kind of uh, mentality. So, um, but I've always had this creative bone in me, um, whether it's writing or music, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's almost, it's always had to be downplayed, you know, as a kid. Yeah, it's funny because I think even now I have a hard time accepting my gift of gab, right? My gift of conversation, my gift of storytelling. And I really think it comes from, in the back of my head, I still see it as fluffy. Does that make sense? No, that makes a tons of sense. I mean, honestly, my folks, my dad's passed, but my mom really doesn't know the impact <laughs> of what I do. You know, because <laughs> we never drank. I mean, so it's kind of funny. Um, even uh, the other day, I get a... Um, a call from one of my sisters. She was reading the Food and Wine magazine and saw an article about me in the back. She was like, well, how come you didn't say nothing? <laughs> like, y'all wouldn't understand. Y'all wouldn't understand. <laughs> exactly. So, no, I mean, so it, it's kind of funny, but I totally feel you. You know, it, mm. it feels like it's la-la land that we're living in. What were the, some of the earliest immigrant hustle inspirations that you saw growing up and, you know, into your young adulthood? Because I feel like growing up in Brooklyn, you must have been seeing a lot of stuff, everyone trying to make it. What were some of your biggest takeaways that you think still sit with you today? Um, the, the largest is, again, the you would wake up, they were gone. You know, mm -hmm. they're coming home after you come back from school. Um, it, it's just kind of funny. Uh, you know, uh, Haitians, we eat uh, plantains or banan, you know, and... Like, my mom's biggest gripe was, how come you don't have a, at least a plantain boiling for me? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, so, but just that sheer, you know, they didn't love those jobs, but they loved their five kids. Yeah. You know, kind of thing. And they went out day in and day out. And I guess I never really heard them complain. You know, um, especially my dad, you know, where um, when he came to the States, you know, white folks called them boat people. And black Americans actually called him Uncle Tom because they thought he was kissing ass. Um, but then even his fellow Haitians, they shunned him because they thought that he made it and wasn't giving back. You know, wow. so my, he couldn't I, win. Correct. So my dad decided to own who he was a long, long time ago. Um, he did yoga before it was cool. He was doing yoga in the 70s, you know, shit like that. Oh, it was kind of against the grain stuff. 
Okay. You know, that you wouldn't think or expect, you know, of him to do. Okay. That's yoga in the 70s. That's interesting. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. No, and my dad wasn't a little dude. You know, he was 6'1", 230. He, was even, he even ran marathons and okay. wore those Kenyan shorts. But, again, <laughs> well, he shouldn't have been. But he decided this is what I'm trying to do. So, you know. Mm-hmm. So I know this is a question you probably get a lot, but. How in the hell did you go from Brooklyn to Oregon? Because that's pretty, just distance-wise, right? But also sure. culturally, it's so it's so much different. You know, what was that path? What was that literal dream drive west looking like for you? Why so did from, it happen? So from New York, I went to school in Florida. Um, and then I did a couple of years in North Carolina. But in 99, I was like, you know what? I'm going west. Um, it was just, I knew there was nowhere in the middle I wanted to stop. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to Cali. You know, that was my destiny. I had no idea what city or anything, but did I Did you drive Cali. or would you, did you just take a plane out there? I drove. Okay. I drove through. But um, I ended up in Oregon because I got a job here. You know, one of my many careers, um, I was working for anesthesiology as an assistant and got a job at a teaching hospital out in Oregon. Um, I looked on the map, and they actually had a hoop team right in town. So I figured, all right, it can't be that horrible. Um, I'd be there for a minute and then work my way down. But uh, that's kind of what got me here. What kept me here is I ended up meeting my wife here. So uh, that's why the dreams of going to Cali never never went to fruition. So tell me about when you – well, you probably knew about this, but when did the opportunity – when did you see an opportunity spark? Tell me about that day you realized you and your your um your in laws they owned a vineyard, right? Why did you think that you could do something? You could make something of it. Tell me that story. Yeah, so um, I always start off with it was part tragedy and part opportunity. Okay. Uh, the tragedy was my dad passing in 07. Um, I immediately felt, you know what, I wasn't living up to that legacy. Uh, like I said, I, I, you take it for granted when you're in it. Um, but after he passed, it was one, you know, I think about that immigrant story and, uh, almost all immigrants. Imagine you as an adult leaving your home country, um, with your kids to say, you know what, we're done. We need to go somewhere else, you know, from Haiti to New York, you know, didn't speak the language, didn't have a degree, but needed to be successful because of all these challenges. Um, that really resonated with me. So I quit my day job. You know, I had money, I had stuff. But the anesthesia technician job? Correct, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I, I quit. I was done. I was like, you know what, I'm done. And, and obviously family was like, okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, um, but the opportunity part is, yes, my in-laws had this property that they planted five acres of grapes for a farm deferral. So in Oregon, and I'm sure in some states, um, in order to get a tax break, you call it a farm. So you have to plant something where most of our neighbors plant <laughs> Christmas trees. Uh, I joke, there's more one chicken farms out here than any. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they had five acres of grapes, you know, because of the, the location and the slope. Um, but no one did anything with it or made wine. Uh, they sold the fruit in a few years, you know, in the past, but it was kind of in disarray. But I was just looking around. I was up there one day looking around and said, I won't make wine. Um, I mind you, I didn't even drink either, you know, so, um, you know what my plan B was going to be? I'm going to make, it? I'm going to make raisins if it don't <laughs> work. <out. laughs> Listen, people, <laughs> you could, you could do something for that. Well, again, but for me, and, and I know I laugh now because wine raisins, with, you know, they got seeds in them and all of that, but I was so detached from what the wine industry was. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that was driving me was if pops did what he can do. I can make me some damn wine, regardless of the fact that I didn't drink, et cetera. But were you, know? you thinking about, you, you thought about making wine, but was the thought ever, I can make money from the wine? You know what I mean? Because I think you could have started out just saying, hey, I want to make wine and see where it goes. But did you see it as a business opportunity or just a, a opportunity to do something new? Um, a little bit of both. Um, I Again, I, it's that immigrant hustle, you know? Yeah. From, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. You know, so even though I was looking at it as something lofty, you know what? I got some grapes here. I'm going to go ahead and do this. Um, the idea of not making money wasn't ever in my head. Uh, the, the wine industry, um, its its monitor, moniker is in order to make a small fortune, you start with a large one. Yeah. Which is bananas. What industry allows that? 
you know you so, always think about that it has like you have to have a lot of money to get into wine like when i think of wine i think of like you know those expensive like hills in california northern california somewhere and people with like i don't know i just have this floofy this this idea in my head of what it what it is or what it is to be part of it and it's and that is a great part of it but that was my opportunity um i even to this day this is year 12 now um and part of, again, my success was I wasn't passionate about the industry. Mm. You know, just some, because there's a lot of broke, passionate winemakers out there because the industry traditions make no sense. Yeah. Pers- um, so even early on, I knew all of the challenges and I knew all of the stumbles. I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to do this my way, though. Uh, and, and again, that's what early on got me started into this to say that, yes, I can still be successful, even though everybody kind of laughed and chuckled, you know, at the idea of, what do you mean you're going to make wine? Don't you know how, you know, how exclusive, you know, that idea of it is. Yeah. What does doing it your way look like? What did it look like back then? Year one, you had this idea. How did you actually go about making wine from from your fruit? Um, so it, I, I did have a a family friend, I guess, um, who was mentor in the sense of he was that person like, oh, yeah, go ahead and make wine. You know, when everybody looked at me like I was crazy. Um, I I give him shit now that, you know, (laughs) it's like, thanks. You should have just said no back then. But um, it was and and we we weren't really friends. It was just the fact that it was a person uh, associated with the industry was just like, sure, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I knew family was saying, sure, go ahead and do it out of, hey, he's going through some grief Great right support. now. <laughs> Stop in a minute. <laughs> but that was the first random, you know, that actually said, sure, again, and him not knowing who I am, um, that was just that little bit of catalyst, you know, that I needed in order to do that. There was a, there is a wine college about 30 minutes away from me, 45 um, that I started the wine program there, but I only lasted three months. You don't like school, uh, right? <laughs> school. I mean, I remember playing uh, sick in kindergarten, not one to go. Um, that just wasn't me um, in the sense of the formal okay. education. I was a hands-on, put me in it, let me go get it, you know. So, yeah, no, it was a two-year program. I lasted three months. I was like, all right. You actually, how did you learn about then? Did you learn the fundamentals from those three months so that you could actually go about making wine? Because I would imagine making wine is hard. All, all of the wine people out there are going to probably hate me, but to me, no. Okay. Wine making is not hard in the sense of, honestly, if you put grape juice in the glass in a couple of weeks, it would be wine. Whether it's good or bad, that's, that's indifferent. Okay. You know? But, um... The fundamentals are pretty basic in the sense of what you do with the steps. Again, uh, people ask me, when did I start? 2008. Uh, when did my first wine come out? In 2008. You know, again, I, I didn't, I wasn't passionate about the industry. I didn't have this idea of, you know, well, I'm going to practice for a couple of years before I release. Um, that immigrant hustle kicked into me. It's like, you know, how can I turn this thing over to make money in this year, you know, kind of thing. So. Were you proud of your first barrel? Is that the right terminology? The first barrel of wine? What do you call the things you hold wine in? Well, yeah, barrels, okay. barrels. Um, now, you, now you're really digging. No, because uh, I say, the reason, let me tell you the background why I say that. I was just talking to someone yesterday, and we were talking about, like, startups, especially in the tech world, where they say that you shouldn't, you should be embarrassed of your first product, or if your first product is so good, that means you started too late, kind of what you were saying. So mm-hmm. your first, your first batch what, what were your thoughts about it? So for me, again, this goes to more personal stuff. I'm never proud. I'm never, mm-hmm. happy. it's never good enough. Um, it's, it's one of those, again, I, I go back to my childhood about not being good enough. It, it, to me, it didn't matter how I felt about it. This is what I needed to do to get it done. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't flawed, let's just say that. Okay. <laughs> uh, and what a lot of people don't realize in the wine industry, there's not one perfect wine. Yeah. I don't care if this wine got tons of gold medals and points. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, so there wasn't really this measuring stick or a basic recipe that you're trying to duplicate. 
you know. Um, so early on, again, even now, um, yeah, I think I, I make solid, good, unflawed wine. Um, but I've shifted everything instead of the wine being the brand to me being the brand. Okay. Uh, I knew I could always bet on me. Uh, and it, it is kind of funny when I think about it um, because I never wanted to be locked in to my wine. I never wanted the wine to be what identified me, good, bad, and different, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, because someone doesn't like the wine. If if the wine was the brand, then that, that's a, um, a correlation to me or them yeah. not liking me. So I always separated me from the wine itself at the end of the day. But are you nervous? You know, I, I like that you talk about that because I think that's something a lot of us, like dream drivers, we, we, we grapple with is, are we the brand or is the product the brand? A lot of people tell me all the time, why do you, I think people think I try to hide behind the brand, like even how I want to do audio only, right? People are like, no, like you should be doing videos. You should be doing all this stuff. And I always think in my head, but I like being behind the scenes. But then I realized that people wouldn't listen to Dreams and Drive if it was a different host, you know? And I think that's, that's the thing that a lot of us are so scared. So how were you able to confidently step into and in, embrace that you are the brand? And how, what uh, advice would you have for others who are who are a little bit nervous about doing that? The the main thing, I've always felt that, like literally up until my seventh, eighth year. Mm -hmm. But what really changed that was when I hired a coach. Okay. Uh, instead of where most people hire a mentor to be a better winemaker, I hired a coach to make me a better me. Mm. Um, it goes back to the whole, I mean, like this is my coach's tagline is own who you are. You know, Eldridge Boussard, he's Mr. Own Who You Are. And that means owning who you are with your positive and your negative flaws. Um, at the end of the day, how do you connect with people? Because we have like challenges and like things. If I all of I, if I, all I talked about was how great of a winemaker I am and, and technical in that sense, there's only a small population that could connect with me. Mm -hmm. um, but if I told you about, you know, my loss, my tragedy, these things, these feelings that were evoked. Um, I say tragedy evokes change. Um, we all can connect in some way or somehow. And that was where I learned how to step out of the box. I am the brand. Um, and even accepting that everyone wasn't gonna be my customer. You know, that's what allowed Abbey Creek to be the hip hop winery of Northwest. You know, that's how we were allowed to, to kind of do things my way. You know, instead of trying to fit into the industry, I took the industry and turned it over and made it my own. What know? were some um, tangible things that you saw change in the business once you made that shift as well? Money. <laughs> really? Like, so you <laughs> legit, you were selling uh, more, getting more people in the tasting room? Because before I was trying to sell wine. Ah. You could buy wine at the damn gas station in Oregon, <laughs> you know? And, and that, to me, that's the biggest flaw in the industry. Everyone's trying to sell wine. There's not enough wine drinkers out there. There's too many competing factors as in price points and the idea of wine. Um, so I decided, you know what? Uh, we, we joke, we call it, we sell love, magic, and moments. Oh. It's, um, that's what people connect to. That's what people come back for at the end of the day. Because if it's about medals and accolades, someone else is always going to have more medals, more points, more accolades. Someone has a bigger budget for marketing and all of these other things. Um, but for us... It was, you know, I've got to get them to buy into me. Um, even if you, if you, you know, check out my IG and all that, I'm always in overalls. And, and that began, began um, back in um, about three years ago. Oregon was celebrating 50 years of winemaking. Mm -hmm. And all they were talking about were the legacies and the pedigrees and who wasn't me. And at that same time, customers would be coming in and saying, who's the winemaker? And when I say me, they... Well, you don't have a vineyard, do you? You know, yeah, I do. And there was always this glare or this look of surprise. And it's not so much that they were being malicious. It was the fact that the industry as a whole painted the picture that I didn't look the part. Mm -hmm. So I decided, you know what? I'm a wine farmer. So I'm going to wear overalls everywhere I go, um, even to black tie events. And were they the, black tie overalls or just your overalls? Black no, black tie overalls. Like, these are my fitted right now. Mm -hmm. But the button-down shirt... And, and my tie and all of that. And the thing is, it started the conversation of, well, why are you wearing overall? And then I get to talk about this lack of diversity or equity um, in our industry that in other conversations might have been tense. Mm -hmm. 
but in the fact that I was rocking the overalls and it, it made it something for them to chuckle about and then start to think, well, you know, you're right. I never seen a black winemaker. I never heard of. And then that's again, that's when I decided to launch the documentary. So I produced the documentary Red, black, Wine, and Black. Yeah. It's red, red, and black. red, white, and black. Okay, I think I wrote it. Good thing you said it because I wrote it down the wrong, the wrong way. The order is but, very important, right? Correct, correct. And then the idea of that was my play on words as well with the with the flag, the red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. um, the red, the white, the black, uh, red, white wine. Um, but it was to share my story uh, and as well as some other underrepresented minorities who you know mm -hmm. get that same look. When they talk about, I refer to Remy, who was a woman and a lesbian in my film. Um, she still gets asked, does her husband make the wine? And why? Exactly, because of tradition. And tradition makes us lazy. Um, but that's still not an excuse. Um, so having those conversations and putting that out there in front and center is, is kind of the things that I've been doing. So. From a business perspective, was this your first entrepreneurial venture? Nah, man, I was making money at <laughs> years old. You know? <laughs> okay. You know, we flipping ice cream pops or whatever, you know? <laughs> so traditional in its sense, um, yes, in the sense of, okay, I've got a business license, my name on that. But I was always in business. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Which, which challenges were harder for you, the personal challenges or the business challenges when it comes to growing the business? And I say that because I think a lot of our guests or a lot of our listeners – sometimes think the business challenges could be the hardest when I found that guests always say it's the personal things. It's the fear. It's the doubt. It's the not feeling confident. It's the, it's all that other stuff for, for you. Which one would you say affected you more? Personal as well. I mean, it, because it takes a shift in thinking, you know, that a lot, like I said, that same shift when I, I said that, you know what, it, I, everyone is not going to be my customer, so I don't need to bend over backwards for that dollar, you know. And it's the thinking because industry, everything. As a kid, you've heard the customer's always right, yeah. but what if it ain't your customer, you know. Um, and, and especially when you're new, it's that fear of, but I need that money. They won't come see me, or I'll get a Yelp review. You know, all of this extra bullshit, you know, because the underlying thought is I need to be successful as not to be a failure. Yeah. So I, I will, uh, you know, take the integrity of, you know, who you are because of what you thought you needed to do. But I always quote the ghetto boys, you know, when I sit alone in my four corner room staring at kids. <laughs> um, there's when, those moments when you're in your own head, mm -hmm. those are the ones that matter. And I never wanted to be in that moment knowing that I was full of shit, yeah. you know. So the personal overall, literally, that was my click, my change. I joke about my coach now is everyone needs to have someone in their camp that doesn't care about how you feel. Mm. Uh, I, I pay him. I pay, you know, I pay him well to be that one guy to not give a damn about my feelings. Um, we talk about facts and feelings. And the first thing you do is you separate the two. Feelings you know? are not facts, right? Correct, and you never want to make judgments off of feelings. You know, what, what are the factual things? Or if you're in your feels, being able to acknowledge, I'm in my feels right now. I'll get back to you, you know, later. But literally, um, I even apply it to my home life, my relationship, my friends, everything. Um, I literally pose that question whenever there's a deciding point or, uh, or something happening at that moment. Mm -hmm. Was there a point um, in this journey that you wanted to give up? Because I can imagine, well, let me let me ask you this beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. What, no, actually ask that first. Was there a point where you wanted to give up? Because, I, you know, now I remember I was going to ask you uh, about the business. Is there money to be made in the wine business or is it a long, is there a long tail before you start seeing that profit come in? That's the myth of the industry, and also that's the bullshit in smoke and mirrors. Okay, so tell us. Tell us the truth. Um, again, traditionally, people, you know, you hear, if you don't have a vineyard, you can't make wine. Um, right now, to plant a vineyard, you're looking at thirty to 40000 an acre. Um, and how and many then, acres know, do you need? Uh, again, it depends on your production, right? Because okay. um, each acre produces about a ton of grapes. Uh, and I'm talking about high-end grapes. You're looking at about a ton each ton only gives you about two barrels. You know, that's only six bottles. Is... Each barrel is 300 bottles. Okay. So that's only 50 cases. 
you know, which you're not moving away. <laughs> but again, it's that idea of you go find this property, you buy the land, you plant the vineyard, and then it takes about five years for any viable fruit, you know, to, to come through. Um, all of these things are what, you know, keeps that, that whole moniker of in order to make a small fortune, you start with a large one. Mm -hmm. uh, means spending all this money and you never make any back. Um, hindsight, I wouldn't have any land, any vineyard. I've got 50 acres right now, and I've got 15 acres in fruit. Um, there's tons of fruit available for sale, you know. Uh, so things like these things no, no one really talks to you about. But actually, I've got this program, a protege, that I'm coming up with is this woman who um, her whole career has been, uh, what should I say, uh, adult foster care. Okay. Uh, the brand is Stony Wines, so look for it. She approached me a couple of years ago. She wants to start her own label. So I built this program to where she could make wine and make her money as well as a profit in the same year. One year, instead of this myth that you have to have at least five years in order for there so to be anything. Correct. I mean, and, and it's basic math. She buys the fruit from me. She knows what she paid per ton. Any business is about cost of goods, right? Yeah. So she knows what she paid per ton. Um, I have my price to flip it for her. Um, we just bottled it the other day, actually. So if she follows my model and sells these bottles by retail, um, she will make three to $5,000 profit in her first year. Wow. And I think that's a good example of... Sometimes you have to really try to, you don't necessarily need to reinvent the industry, but you can reinvent how you approach the industry. And a lot of us creatives, especially listen in, we might think that there's no entry point for us because we're trying to get into the same door everyone's going through, but not realizing you could just go to the left and build your own door. And it's probably, there's probably more behind that door than the other door, right? Well, no, indeed. And again, I mean, on paper, I'm not supposed to be successful. I make 1,500 cases a year. I do not sell to restaurants or stores or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Everything is direct to customer. Um, it's funny. I, I was just um, in New York. I was on the panel for the Future of Everything Festival. Okay. And, and the moderator, her question was, well, sure, you sell direct to customer, so there's no middleman, but no one knows your name. I said, well, how am I at the Future of Everything Festival in New York City? The moderator City? said that? That seems a little, like, did she not do her research to realize? I was not, <laughs> not. You know, and everybody chuckled. And, you know, it was like, you see, again, everybody's just thinking, you just got to sell wine. I'm more, I'm so much more than just my wine. You know, mm -hmm. I've decided to, you know what, I'm going to leverage my story in the tragedy. Yes, I'm Oregon's first black winemaker, you know, but it's more important that I'm not the last. You know, so that's what I lead with. And I mean, I don't love the industry. I don't. I love what the industry allows me to do. Mm -hmm. it's, and I'm leveraging all of the myths and the romanticism of what wine is to, to open doors. And even more importantly, bridging the gap. Yes. You know, yeah, we're the hip hop winery and you would think millennials and people of color. I've got more baby boomer white folks in here that you see them bobbing their head to whatever. <laughs> don't know why. Because it just feels good. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. And that's what we have is our transparency. You know, um, the word terroir is one in the industry, which refers to the soil, the climate, where the grapes are grown. For us, our terroir is the space that we're in, you know, that energy that comes from our customers, you know, that are in the place when you walk in the door. So I saw that word when I was doing research and I kept I kept I'm like, what is what does this mean? Because it what was just it was in every article about wine. I had to go and and, and Google it. Um, but, you know, what I also think is interesting being a black man and me being a black woman and. You know, my background, I went to, like, private schools growing up. I went to Princeton and always feeling uncomfortable and not knowing the type of wine to choose because you think you're being judged by your wine choice. And, like, to me, it's like I just want a short, like, a simple red wine, a simple Chardonnay. Like, I didn't – but I always thought, oh, you have to have the more expensive wine. You have to know the different nodes and under – whatever they are called. Like, I didn't know it, and I always felt embarrassed and so I always felt like wine was something that was not for me. And I, I went, what do you think about that being the narrative, especially for people of color? Because there are some spaces where you are judged if you go to, let's say, a business meeting with someone and they're ordering all this stuff and you're just ordering the, the regular, you know? 
Yeah, no, I always refer to Bob the wine guy. You know, that <laughs> one white dude in the office who's been everywhere and wants to tell you how to fucking drink. Yeah. Uh, for me, at the end of the day, this is, again, why we do what we do. I want everyone, especially people of color, young and old, to feel comfortable in their wine choices. Yeah. Um, the wine industry is a lot of uh, insecurity. You know, it's all about why would you have the fancy sommelier come to your table to choose your wine bottle? So you can let your friends know that you and him have the same palate. Mm. No, this person has trained, you know, X amount of years, spends tons of money to be a professional wine taster, or wine buyer, et cetera. Uh, and it's this idea of trying to show folks that, oh, yeah, I've done that, too. Or I get tons of them. Oh, have you been to France? Nope. Have you been to Italy? Nope. I don't make wine for those folks. I don't mm. need that validation. Again, it's the difference when you decide that you're enough then my wine doesn't matter, or my wine choice, et cetera. And that's why I love, I had a couple of uh, young brothers, young cats that, you know, heard the story, they came in, and uh, in the middle of it, they were like, oh, yeah, we're doing that fancy stuff. I said, no, you're doing everyday regular people stuff. The industry is what's telling you that you don't belong or you don't fit in. Mm -hmm. That's that underlying exclusion, you know, that people don't get that's in the industry. Well, anybody could drink wine if you do this, this, and no. You sh I shouldn't have to jump through your hoops in order to feel validated, you know, about some wine. And the thing is, if you go to these other countries, and I've heard stories, it's nothing, it's no big deal in these countries because they drink wine every day with anything. You know, some of the best wine is the $3 wine that yeah. comes to the restaurant table like your bottle of water here in the States. You know, so it's that, it's that idea of that... Um, um, I don't want to use the word pretentious because it is and that's the given, but it's this idea of entitlement that I've got to let you know, you know, this is my status, you know, so thing at the end of the day. And but that was my biggest crutch in the industry. Um, and even for me, it had to change because I was always trying to show you that I wasn't that. Yeah. As opposed to just showing you who I am. You know what I was thinking about as you were talking? Just when you're thinking about, you know, wine being... It's alcohol, right? Would you call it an alcoholic beverage, right? Yes, it is. Um, it's a, yeah. Thinking about liquor. And I'm just thinking about hip-hop, but how so many hip-hop artists are the face of liquor brands, but I've never seen anyone the face of a wine brand, right? And it's also saying how the industry's controlling how they're marketing and how they're getting dollars. And would would wine change if they had, let's say people endorsing wine brand. You know, it's, I just thought about that. Wait, why is no hip-hop artist the face of a wine brand, but they have all these, you know, tequila brands and all this other stuff? Imagine just how much that would change if more people realized that they didn't have to be excluded from that as well. Well, and that's actually part of the shift. So E-40's got a brand. Oh, he does? Uh, okay. Yeah, E-40, Nicki Minaj. Um, I know John Legend partnered up with a brand as well. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, there are a few. Uh, even Google my man, uh, RJ Mack. He's in New okay. York. Yeah. Um, Maison Noir Wines. Um, Andre, you know, he, he plays up to the hip-hop. You know, he's got OPP. Okay. You know, other people's Pinot, other people's Pinot Gris. He's got Love John. You know, so he definitely, he was a 90s hip-hop kid like myself. So, well, he does. Okay. I need to get up on it then. <laughs> but not enough, again, for us to see mainstream-wise because why they're already setting the tone of what we're going to drink. Yep. Black for, and it's funny. I, I got some comments because in the documentary, I say, you know, why we're not marketed to because they think that we drink Henny, you know, uh, 40s and sweet wine. You know, because that's the idea. That's the stereotype that's out there. So they don't decide to, to me at the end of the day, I want to take that same stereotype and have us feel comfortable drinking anything. Mm -hmm. Those are more customers for me at the end of the day. I'm trying to create my own customer brand as opposed to just following the, the small masses that the industry tells me I need to follow, you know, at the end of the day. so. Why was making red, white, and black so important to you? It's about representation at the end of the day. How can I change the narrative? Uh, and I basically break it down to I'm trying to change the world by changing the game, you know, and changing the game was... Uh, again, no one gave me anything. I had to do it myself. So I was like, I'm going to make my own movie. Um, up until 2016, uh, the only president my kids knew was Obama. Mm. Yeah. When you the think only one they should know, right? <laughs> not, this, <laughs> not this one we got now. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, well, when you really think about that, think about that representation yeah. and what their lives are going to be and do and different from now on. Um, I get emails from adult grown folks, you know, that hear the story and it, it inspires and empowers them. Like, you know, and not even about doing wine, but just going into industries that, you know what, like that fluff you talked about. And I can do this, too. You know, yeah. again, why not? We can actually all do whatever the hell we want to do. It's just what are we willing to sacrifice yep. to get to those points, you know? And, and that's what I'm trying to show and be a testament to. So that representation and back to your previous point and making money on top of that. Yeah, because we deserve all. I feel like, you know, it's funny. I was also talking to a friend about this is sometimes we have these ideas and we're not think that we, we execute the idea, but never think about how can we actually scale into a long term business? How can we create generational wealth? For example, I'm hoping like, you know, you can pass this on to, down to your, your children and they can pass it on down to their children. We're building something that outlives us. Um, I think that's really important. You talked about, though, you talked about sacrifice. Was there anything you had to sacrifice in order to really get this, to keep this business going, to keep Abbey Creek going? Well, the first thing was um, to, to second, and then let's go back a little bit, though, about okay. the you know, generational wealth and mm-hmm. uh, even taking it more. I don't want my kids to follow in my footsteps. Okay. I want them to do their own thing. I want them to know that they can start from scratch and do their own amazing, because that's where the bullshit of the industry came from, of the wine industry, from this pedigreed, oh, did your dad make wine or your granddad? And nah, none of that. You know, and, and, and in a sense, I feel it's dismissing, you know, the importance of what I did do. Yeah. You know, by always thinking, well, I didn't start it on my own because it's impossible, you know, kind of thing. I don't want them feeling like they need to. Obviously, if they want to, that's a whole nother story. Um, but again, I go back to that immigrant hustle. I go back to my parents, you know, story of being those pioneers and trailblazers and stepping out, you know, because nobody asked a plumber, you know, are you going to do some generational wealth? <laughs> that's still the idea of the bullshit that the wine industry wants you to think that because you're making wine, it's important. And, you know, you have to pass it on down like it's a badge. You know, at the end of the day, alcohol is poison, right? It kills people, you know, so no one wants to talk about wine in that sense, you know, but it is, you know, we're just talking facts right now. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, for me, it's more important to show them that no matter what lofty dream that it seems, you can do that and make money. Uh, my coach had a, uh, not an argument, but a, a discussion with some other dude was all about, well, I need to find this niche, you know, so um, then I could get paid. And my coach was like, well, why don't you just do what you love and then find a way to make that make you money? Oh, that's what I'm struggling with right now. That's sick shit, you know, again. So now it's about flipping that and thinking about, okay, how else can I, you know, make, you know, this successful and make this a career? You know, and that's why I talk about the sacrifices, you know, about um, going out of your norm. You know, for me, it was being transparent. It was being vulnerable to letting people know of the tragedy of the past, which has brought me here to where I am today. No one likes that. You go to social media. Social media wasn't built on you talking about your flaws. No. Nope. Except for those days that you want everybody to, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. You know? Yeah. But for the most part, you put happy fly shit, right? At the end of the day. Um, but again, people, more people can connect to my flaws and my mishaps and my mistakes than any success that I throw out there, you know, at the end of the day. But for me, that was that sacrifice. That was the sacrifice of being transparent, Mm -hmm. you know, as to this is who I am, love me or leave me alone, you know, sort of mentality and attitude, you know. But that's where, again, that's where my success comes from. You know, it's just vulnerable. Um, And I think, so so this, the wine is really just the vehicle for the message that you're carrying. Yes, ma'am. It's funny because my winery used to be a church when I bought it. You know, yeah, I kid you not. <laughs> so we've been holding church up in here. You know, every weekend we bring close to 200 people a weekend wow. who heard the story. I bring people who don't even drink. They just wanted to come take a picture or a touch. And how many of us, your every day inspires and empowers others? That's powerful. Yeah. But, I mean, real talk, I had to own that. I knew I was the first black winemaker 10 years ago. 2015 was when I decided, okay, I will wear this cape, you know, and be the Superman or superhero at the end no, of the day. No, you wear the overalls, not the cape. The overalls. Yes, 
it made, but yeah. <laughs> but again, but even about the overalls. Um, so last year, uh, I got a call from Carhartt. And I'm like, well, what's Carhartt calling me? They want a donation or something? What? what? Um, and no, they were doing this campaign. Now, Carhartt's been making clothes for 140 years. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows their stuff is great. But um, for them to get more business or new faces, they need to start talking about the story of the people who wear their stuff. So they were on the West Coast and they Googled Black Farmer. And my picture shows up and I'm in their overalls. Um, now I'm a brand, I just signed a contract for a year as a brand ambassador for Carhartt. But these opportunities wouldn't have come if I didn't decide to sacrifice and own being this guy in overalls and having to share that story every time. There were days I didn't want to put my overalls on, but I made that my brand. Yeah. You know, people expect to see me in those. That's why there's tons of photos out there with me in my overalls. But just owning that truth turned around and turned this now into I'm a brand ambassador with Carhartt. You know, kind of, which, again, I think the hardest part about sacrifice, you think, okay, I sacrificed. Where's <laughs> you know? Hello. <laughs> exactly. And I think, again, that's what we need to change, the way we think about that. It needs to be, it needs to be in them. What's the word? Um, it needs to be true. It needs to be honest. You know, if you, you can't sacrifice, just like your diet. All right, I'm, I'm doing Whole30 or keto or whatever. And in week three or four, you're like, okay, I'm not seeing results. I'm going to stop. Yeah. You know? So, again, it, and, but the beauty about that, that you're in control of all of this. You know, and I employ people to, we invest in any bullshit in your business, but how many of us invest into us? Like I said, yeah, that's so true. Like, you know, we, we hesitate to spend the dollar on ourselves. And especially people of color. You know, um, mental health is a big thing. You know, on one end, when everybody says, my gosh, Bertone is a hard worker. He's always got irons in the fire. I'm broken. You know, my always pushing forward is because of my insecurities or fear as a young person of not being good enough. You know? Mm-hmm. And you're, own, but, you're owning that now. You're being transparent okay. about that. Yeah, but, that's, but that's also what makes me get more than that other dude. You know, because he ain't grinded. You know what I mean? And that's my grind. We dismiss all of that so much. As, oh, that's just hustle. Nah, nah, you're broken. You know, but doesn't mean I am, I'm fixed, but I accept why, you know, I am the way I am. And that's where my success comes from. It. So I'm just leveraging you know, these things or these issues that I've, I feel I've had in order to make me successful at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, I think I asked you this a little bit earlier, but was there a point where you felt like giving up? Because, you know, I think there's sometimes where we hit ruts along this journey and, like, you might want to get out the car and be like, mm, I need a new car. I'm not, even, I'm not even doing no cars. I'm about to get on a bike right now. You know, yeah. was, there, was there a point for you? And if so, what, what helped you stay on, the, on track? Um, there, there were always those points. Um, I'm only half amazing, so <laughs> I have those moments. Um, first and foremost is, you know, your your immediate circle. Yeah. You know, for me, it's my family, it's my wife, uh, it's the people close to me. Um, that was the first. Um, but the other is is my legacy, his pops. Yeah. You know, um, unfortunately, it took his passing for me to truly get to these points of of feeling like, you know what, I can do whatever, you know, kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And there, there was a mission there. Um, and for me, I, I can't let, even though everybody says, oh, your dad is great, he's proud of you, and blah, blah, blah. Um, at the end of the day, I think about a grown man at 30 years old taking his wife. My dad is, he used to work on a ship that docked in Miami and mm-hmm. got off one day and made his way to New York, sent for my mom and the other two kids. And then my sister was born. That allowed them to stay. I still don't know the catalyst. You know, and we never had those conversations. Yeah. And, and it's even to the point where I don't even know if I can ask my mom without getting her in her feels. You know, um, I, I call it conversations we never had. And and then, I mean, the real thing that makes me push is my 12 and 10-year-old. I'll be a fucking hypocrite. Mm-hmm. You know, look at them, and I'm trying to always tell them to keep pushing and, and basically do your times tables. You know? <laughs> You're going to need them one day. Those I, you will need. You will need. I don't know about the geometry and all the other stuff. <laughs> in real talk, it's just, just thinking about them. And like I said, 
and myself, when I'm sitting by myself in my head, I, I can't accept the fact that I was full of shit or I failed or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, but to the same extent, I do have the, the wherewithal to know if something ain't working either. And that's yeah. important because I think sometimes you could stay doing the same thing and not seeing any results. So sometimes you can't be consistent, so consistent that you don't realize hey, you're not going what, anywhere. Yeah, this is not making sense. It's time to leave it again. Um, and you can apply that to relationships and everything. We always, I, I'm not a quitter. I never quit. But what if that shit wasn't for you? <laughs> you know. Yeah. You don't, so again, having that idea or thought, and I wholeheartedly always recommend any entrepreneur to have a coach you have and which coach it all depends on you and what you need but you need that person that you pay to tell you you know what's up you know at least what they see yeah. you know and that's my my coach's superpower you know yeah. when the, you can say a sentence and he'll get, break it down to what you actually said you're like nah but i meant i don't care what you meant mm-hmm. words matter this is what you said you know, and we need to even pro athletes have uh, sports psychologists and all of that. So it doesn't mean that you got to be rich in order to have somebody in your camp like that. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, again, you oh, you need that one person who doesn't really care about your feelings. You know, at the end of the day, to me, that's where um, more of the success is going to come from. And what's your superpower, Bertoni? Oh, I have many. I'm, I have multiple superpowers. Um but my superpower is, is being able to connect with people. Okay. Um, again, you should see the diversity of the folks that come in here that wholeheartedly love and support us. Like I said, it's not, there's amazing wine all around me, you know, but people intentionally come to where we are um, because of a feeling, you know, and, yeah. and I, I've always, and then it, but it's funny because that feeling was from a young man never wanting to be the angry black guy, you know, yeah. So I've always turned it into a, a, a smile or, um, and not necessarily going against my grain to make you comfortable, but I've just always been able to connect. And it's funny because I'm an introvert at heart. I wouldn't, I mean, you know what? I could see because I feel like I also am an introvert in different settings. But when I'm, when I'm acting, when I'm talking about what I love to do, that's when it comes out. But other times I like to stay to myself and observe people. I think that's what makes me a good storyteller is that I can see the little, the little nuances and things. Right. Um, that's, that's really important. Um, I have a question for you for those people who are listening in, who feel like they're stuck in park, right? This, this podcast is called dreams and drive. They feel stuck in park. They want to get into drive. What advice would you give them? Go out of your norm. Uh, so many of us say we want change or we want something different, and your actions and your words don't match. You know, I want to lose weight, but then your actions are you're eating ho hos. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's again, and I, I don't want to sound uh, crass, but it's just that simple. Making sure your actions and your words are matching, and what are you doing in order to get that to happen? And uh, a big thing that business and entrepreneurs, just people in general, relationships. Relationships are key, not networking. Yeah. Networking is only this ploy. I cannot stand the term networking. I hate networking events. First thing you do when you go to a networking event, what do you do? You put a badge on and says, my name is. So now everyone's just looking at, nope, don't want to talk to him. <laughs> I can't say his name. I'm not going to even try. Next. Or industry is not a like industry. You're not going to bother. Yeah. No. That old school connecting and relationships. To me, that is where the success comes from at the end of the day. Again, and we, they don't teach black folks this. White folks have been making deals out of relationships all day. On the golf course, <laughs> in the bathroom. Who knows? <laughs> but they don't necessarily like each other. They see how can they leverage. And again, people see the word leverage as something negative. No, you're leveraging me. I'm leveraging you. You know, it's a positive thing. The, the bad part is you being leveraged, you know, in a way that you don't appreciate. Yeah. That's a whole nother story. But relationships are key. You know, go out there and make you have no idea who that person next to you, you know, is and things like that. And again, I think what faults us is we're always... We're transparent. We're transparent in the sense of we're gonna keep it real. I don't fuck with nobody, you know, who doesn't make me feel X, Y, Z. Get out your fields. Mm. You, know? you got to get out your fields and start making those relationships at the end of the day. Because if this is about business, then relationships matter. 
Yeah, and I think collaboration over competition too. I think sometimes people are scared to talk to people. Oh, she's doing what I'm doing. But why does that? You guys can be serving different audiences, or you you can you can share the audience. There's always. I think a lot of people get scared to collaborate. Um, what's the word? Horizontally, and they're always Correct. trying to ha- collaborate vertically, not realizing you need to build with the people who are around you. Kind of like I always, I will always look at like Issa Rae. Do you know who Issa Rae is? Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like how she had the awkward black girl series on YouTube, and she was just had her her friends film her and now she has a show on HBO but she brought up those same people that were all working with her on the YouTube series Correct. because they all were just in it together and they didn't see each other as competition they saw it as how can we collaborate for us all to get where we need to go so I, that's what I would con- I would contribute to that as well and then even I, I don't like the word collaborate okay. um, it's it's too one sided Mm. Uh, and, and I'm just speaking from experience. I've collaborated with many, collaborated with many people that didn't hold their end of the collaboration up, mm. and a lot of that is actually my fault by not putting that out there. You know, mm. is not putting out my expectation of what. So I use the word partnership. Okay. Partnership now. Okay. Well, shit. I guess I got to do something too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a monetary thing equal. You know. But there's expectations to me, I think, when you start with the word partnership, mm-hmm. it's a collabo, you know. And again, I, I fault the hip hop world in, in the sense of these cool ass terms and phrases that we all think, you know, are, are dope. Mm-hmm. But I don't really know the definition of the expectation of each one of those. YOLO is my worst. Mm-hmm. Uh, you only live once. No, you live every day. You die once. You know, mm-hmm. so this idea that, you only live once, so I'm going to do whatever, yeah. you know, and, and be about, reckless with it. Good. Correct, and that's that's the that's the intent. I get what they were saying, you know, live your life today, you know, kind of thing. But it it it, it lends towards the the reckless side of mm-hmm. living your. Life. But uh, yeah, no partnership is key again. But then finding the right partners, mm-hmm. being okay turning down certain partnerships because they if you can't leverage them, I mean, if you want to be friends, let's be friends. But business-wise, if you're talking about collaboration and partnering, there needs to be an end goal. And again, that's not crass, um, and that's not being malicious. It's just being a business person. Mm-hmm. You should not partner with anybody who, and especially somebody who's not going to who's going to affect your character. Your character brand is more important than anything else out there. You know, at the end of the day, so your brand. If that's then, but again, you remember that when you actually attach you to the brand. Yeah. It, when you're the brand, you think about, hold up, who am I partnering with? Who am I collaborating with? You know, do I want this person's thoughts, ideologies, et cetera, just because it looks good on business? On yep. To be associated with you, because people will now remember, they'll remember that uh, collaboration if it wasn't, or that partnership if it wasn't, if it was not, e- I don't want to say equally yoked, but you, you get what I'm saying. Like, if, if there's a misalignment. Correct. If there's a mis- because of where you want your brand to be or the words you speak, mm-hmm. being able to partner up with somebody just because it's a great money deal, you know, but if it's not going to influence your platform, you know, why, why do that as well? So it, it takes a lot of, you know, uh, but again, relationships and talking it out. And that, like I said, and I, I know I sound like a, a springboard for coaches, but you, we all need that one person, you know, who's going to be able to, you know, go ahead and pull you out of those those lanes to see things. Mm-hmm. So I have two last, two more questions, okay? Sure. Uh, yeah. Should more people get into the wine industry? Um, <laughs> more people just in general? I'm, I'm going to let you answer that. It's open-ended. It's open-ended. Um, it all depends on what you want from it. Okay. Again, just like any other industry. You know, should more people make pens? <laughs> it all depends. What you want. I want the smoothest writing pen ever. <laughs> you know, again, I've been, a, I'm an accidental winemaker. Um, I've been able, so I'm even changing that term. I'm a change maker. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what the wine industry allows me to leverage. You know, it allows me. And then on business, I, I'm a keynote speaker as well. So I get to go and talk about essentially how you're enough, you know, and you can do X, Y, Z. And then at the reception, guess who's wine they're going to drink? My wine. Yes. So <laughs> I leverage that as a business as well. Um, but it's all about what you want out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, 
And if you want to be the first or whatever, then you got to decide, okay, I'm going to take being this representation of this industry or tech or, or whatever, every industry, you know, so, um, but again, you got to, everyone can't do that. Everyone's not built for this. It's, some people just want to go punch the clock and go home and they're content. You know, I hear that a lot, especially in Oregon, because yes, Oregon, Portland's on paper is the whitest city in America. That's you know? why I was surprised. I was like, wait, wait, wait. Am I am I reading this right? <laughs> but where else could I be the most impactful at? That's true. I mean, I, that, I mean, when you think about that, again, we all talk about tokens and a token being negative. When you go to Vegas, you want those tokens, don't you? Yeah. You know, so why don't you put the value on that token? Because yeah. at the end of the day, someone needs to see me here. You know, we're all influencers and it's up to us how we influence. So someone had to see me in the whitest city, you know, in America. Um, but like I said, and then it's not just um, creating the most impact for the people of color who see me. I'm also creating impact on the population that's out here, the white folks, the whoever, you know, in their towns and their spaces to see. So it's twofold, but that's that bridging the gap side I talked yeah. about, you know, as well. So. All right. I'm um, last question. This my, I know you said that sometimes you can be your biggest critic, right? But what are you most proudest about when you think about the journey of Abbey Creek and all that you've accomplished? Oh, that I'm still growing. You know, um, I'm always in drive. I hate the word plateau. Um, I feel you're either getting better or you're getting worse. Mm-hmm. Um, but I look around and it's funny because I just, I just brought on literally this year two associates. I've done the first 10 years pretty much by myself. Wow. Um, and I mean, vineyard work and everything. And I asked, I'm like, how in the hell did I do this? <laughs> you know, but I still don't let myself revel in it. Um, I'm, I call myself, I don't celebrate. I don't feel down. I'm just even keel. I, I ride the middle a lot, you know, at the end of the day. But um, no, when I look around and it's, I mean, we're about to open up a second location, you know, in downtown. In Oregon? Port- yeah, in Oregon. But uh, in downtown now, in our downtown area, that happens in October. You know, so all of these opportunities and things that, you know, are, are in front of us, I put in the work, you know. So um, it actually feels good in a way, the fruition, because all of my life has been keep moving and not being content and switching and flip-flopping. Mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to, I still flip-flop here, but I'm still in the wine industry. Okay. You know, so I found an industry that allows me to, to flip-flop and change the games. I'm making movies, I'm writing a book, you know, which all goes back to me making wine. Yeah. You know? So I finally found that angle that allowed me to be, to do, to be 10 different things under one umbrella, you know? So that's kind of where my proud is at. So let's go to our quick lightning round. Uh, uh, you know, if you want to be a dream driver, you have to have your keys to success, right, Bertoni? So tell me three things that you think every dream driver needs in their toolkit before they hit the road. Ooh, again, you need you need a coach. Every basketball team, every hoop team, there's a coach, there's a captain. You need a coach and, um, and not so much a mentor. Like I said, a mentor is all about you duplicating what they did. Yeah. Um, I want somebody to make me a better me at the end of the day. So sometimes that coach, whatever advice they give you to make you a better you may not be better for the business. You know, so again, you have to decide what's, where's the value at? Yeah. Yeah. So you need a coach. What else? Two other things you think we all need, or we all, two other keys to success. Oh, you need to be honest with yourself. Yep. Um, honestly, I, I, again, it's easy to, to tell anybody whatever bullshit, but you need to be honest with you. So having that, that relationship um, with yourself is number one, too. All right. So being honest and then having a relationship with yourself, would that be the third one? or? Oh, no, the, um, I would put honest and relationship with yourself in the same thing. Okay, okay. Um, the third one would be balance. Mm. You need balance. That's where I struggle the most. Um, in the sense of taking care of myself, my own mental health, whatever it means, balance with my family. Again, it'd be great for me to say, oh yeah, I'm doing this for my family, but then I don't see them, I don't spend the yeah. time, I go to the basketball games, I don't, you know. So uh, balance is key. Okay. Because at the end of the day, what are you really doing all of this for? It, it's all for not. So the second and the third tie into each other. 
you know, so the honest being honest about, you know, the uh, expectations or why you're doing things. And then the balance of keeping it all in check. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brett Tony. This has been such a wonderful conversation. And I'm happy that I even did this via video. So I, I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to put the video up, but I'm just happy that I even said, let me do something new. Let me not limit myself and say I only do audio. I did I love something that. new. So love that. that's growth in its own. So yeah. revel in. Thank you. Um, where can our listeners find you online if they want to connect, they want to watch a documentary, if they want to buy some wine? Let us know. Easiest is going to be abbeycreekvineyard.com. That's A-B-B-E-Y, Creek, and Vineyard, V-I-N-E-Y-A-R-D.com. And it has all the tabs for the documentary, wine. It gives you more in-depth uh, stories about myself, the change maker as well. So it gives you more of that copy. And you ship uh, nationwide? I ship to about 32 states. Okay. Uh, alcohol is tricky. Is so, New Jersey and, one of them? Because I'm in New Jersey. I cannot ship to Jersey. Jersey. What about uh, New York? They ship to my grandmother's house. Okay. To New York. <laughs> I'm going to send my grandmother some wine. She won't drink it, though. <laughs> Baby, this box came for you. <laughs> She's Jamaican, so she'd be like, I want this. I yes. want this. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Bertoni. Right on, Raina. You have a good one, dear.